All right, last chance after housekeeping here. <laughs> well, um, continuing our discussion about the body, I've been thinking about the body as ethics. We don't think of the body as ethics, really. Uh, we think that ethics is a kind of mental activity, ethical, but in fact, as I've started thinking about it, <clears throat> how in the world can you have ethics without the body? It's just an essential part of, of action. So even though we say, well, we have the mental <coughs> issues which determine partly what we do or how we interpret what we do, but the more I think about it, uh, the more I truly believe that our bodies function as the main receptacle for ethical issues. And that you cannot understand ethics without really trying to deal with the body. And that's true not only in Buddhism, but I think it's true in general for ethical behavior. So, <clears throat> the body comes to us at birth. We're not sure when we really have self-consciousness of our body. Um, when do infants realize that it's their body? Um, we say that, that rebirth in the Buddhist tradition is that it reflects all of the past baggage whatever that is, that goes back through time and memorial. And at that moment of sufficiency, that means the birth of the child, the birth of any of us, when we come into this world, at that moment, we bring all our baggage, whatever it is, our DNA, we bring our physical bodies, we bring whether they're perfectly formed or deformed, we bring our bodies, whether they have a brain in them that's really smart, or one that's not quite so dim, a little bit dimmer. Whatever it is, we come with it. Um, and so, at that moment, even in the, at that moment in the Buddhist tradition, birth is a kind of symbol of the ethical past. Because whatever the body is like at that moment is a reflection of behavior from past lives. So that says that any form which our body takes to some degree is ethical or deals with the ethics of our behavior. Whether it's behavior we remember or behavior which we can say belongs. So this body which comes is is our introduction to part of our ethical heritage. I mentioned to you before, I think, I've been also thinking more as I get older about the fact that we are all uh, representing the generations that go before us. And we don't know what those generations did. We're not that familiar with the battles that went on in our great-great-grandparents' homes. We don't know what happened to them, really. We have very little evidence, even when we talk about our family heritages, we're pretty lucky if we have a name and a date of birth. <laughs> That may be a date of death. That's sometimes all the information we have from past generations. And yet, all of us 
I'm sure, are carrying the influences of all those past generations. Somehow in our, the ways in which we come into this world and what we have to live with is always influence because we have to live with parents who had parents that they lived with, who in turn had parents they lived with. We don't live with any of them. It's a little bit like what we say in in the new social uh, environment. I may speak directly to Elaine. She speaks to Laura. Laura didn't speak to me. So we say I have a strong connection to Elaine and a weak connection to Laura. And yet, whatever I said that was passed through to Laura may in fact be very influential in her life because she, even if she didn't hear it directly from me, she heard it. When she in turn passes it on to Joe, the links are getting weaker. But it doesn't say that, that the influence or the impact is getting less. We don't know. We're constantly trying to build up the nodes and the connections, social connections. So social media is teaching us that we have, just what the Buddhists have always said, we are all interconnected. And we're having all kinds of edges that exist between us, lines of connection. And we don't even sometimes realize Joe may never know where Laura got the idea which she gave him. It's from you. <laughs> no, I'm just not necessarily that. These are examples only, but they're not stating truth. So when we look back, though, in the generations of our lives, my connection to my parents is direct. But my connection to my grandfathers is, is weak because they were both dead before I was born. So I never saw a grandfather. I never knew a grandfather. And yet, whatever they were like influenced my parents, who influenced me. So even though my connection to my grandfathers is weak, it's not that it isn't there. It is still there. But it was not a direct. It was an indirect connection. So my connection to my great-grandfather is even more indirect. I didn't know the grandfather and I didn't know the great-grandfather, so all of those are indirect connections but yet the influences from them, to some degree, have shifted and sifted down through time to me. And so, when I speak about the ethics of the body, I'm talking about behavior as much as anything. And the behavior in the past, whatever it was, and I don't know what it was, really, I have no idea about the relationship of my great-grandfather to his grandfather. I just don't know it. But it was there. And it has influenced, I'm sure, has influenced me indirectly in ways which I will never be able to decipher. So when we're born, this little baby that's born there, this little baby has got all those influences. All those generations, believe, whether you believe in karma or not, you certainly have to say the baggage which comes with the birth of this baby into a particular family, to particular parents, is into all of that pre-generational activity, known or not. You don't have to know where it comes from, but it's, it can be very real. 
so behavior, uh, any behavior that we have in one sense or another is ethical. The Buddhists always say good, bad, and neutral. Um, but behavior is very difficult to judge. So the embodiment of behavior is sometimes we can track it in our body, for example, with stress hormones. If we knew what our stress hormonal level was at any point, we would know a great deal about why we feel the way we feel. Why is it I wake up this morning and feel oh, too much, it's just too much. Um, I can't face the day, I, I want to, I'm listening to Hillary Clinton say, after the election, she woke up and there were some days she just wanted to stay in bed with a book and not go face the world at all. Well, I'm sure somebody who's gone through what she's gone through, the stress hormonal level must have been very, very high. And the emotions and all the stuff that comes. But we all have that to, to one degree or another. So that our behavior and the physical behavior is sometimes not what we normally think of as our behavior. My body is behaving. And part of that behavior is how much stress hormone it's produced. That's body behavior. Well, I say that's beyond me. I can't control my stress hormone level. Mm, well, <laughs> we're not innocent in terms of how our stress hormone level is developed. We are part of whatever goes on. So that I may think my only thing that I have to worry about is what other people see my body doing. And that's all I should worry about. If nobody sees my body doing anything that's wrong or bad or whatever, uh, isn't that good behavior? But when our behavior influences our the very functioning of our internal body, then in a way, the functions of our internal body are to one degree ethical. That's, that's our personal ethic with ourself. And we have to deal with the result of whatever the internal functioning of this body is. And we're part of that. We, we are the, we, and then the Buddhists have taught us, who is this we? Who is this I? What is this body? <laughs> what are we talking about? When we're really dealing with things which at one level are empty of the nature which we would like to attribute to them. And yet at the same time, there is functionality. The body may be empty, as we said last time, you could squeeze it into a sugar cube or beyond. That's okay, but the body, even though it's empty in one sense, it functions. The functionality may be temporary, it may be interconnected, it may not have its own self-core, but it's still functioning. It's like an automobile. If it functions, all the parts are working together. That's what we call life. So, I believe that body action, whether it's even as what one of my organs does, is ethical at one level. It's influenced by what I think, what I have done, why I did it, how it affects me, what I feel about it. All of those are ethical issues. And my body is constantly, physically responding to every single thing I do. 
So let's go back a bit in history. <coughs> Shakti Muni's body. The Buddhists paid a lot of attention to Shakti Muni's body. We are told in the in the text a great deal about what it was like when he was born. We're told about his birth story. We're told about the fact that he, some people feel that he was, the description of him being born from his mother's side was very possible that it was Caesarean. Rough as that may have been at that time, and that he killed her and that she only lived for a few days after producing him. That's one of the theories behind the story of the Buddha being born from his mother's side. We're told that he was very, did super normal things. He took seven steps. He was an exceptional child. We also see that they, they have him grow up. Uh, he was trained in archery, in warfare. He was a kshatriya. That is, he was in a military family, if you will. And so he was trained to have a body which was physical. He could run, shoot, ride, jump. In many ways, it describes an athlete. And that this was considered in the military Kshatriya family in India, a necessary component of who a person is. So we hear about his body being like this. We also uh, in terms of art, if you've seen through the lectures, people have felt that they really wanted to show his body when he put himself under the enormous stress of not eating and became skin and bones. And then the images were made of the skin and bones Shakyamuni. That's his body. When he decided, this is not going to give me enlightenment. <laughs> He was right at the edge of death from that eating. So we go through the life cycle of the Buddha and you find at many turns the body, the physical body of Shakyamuni is presented over and over again. In the, what I consider to be the oldest Mahayana Sutra, that was translated into Chinese in the second century. There is in there a very interesting story of making the image of the Buddha. It's the oldest indication of what people thought about what shall we do if we make an image based on the physical body of Shakyamuni. In that text, it says, you should not do this unless you have actually seen him. In other words, they said the first image of him should be made by somebody who knew what he looked like. And then it goes on to describe what did he look like. And it, said, it says, he was upright and handsome. He was a good-looking guy. And upright probably means he was athletic. He was strong, physically strong, and good-looking. That's what they thought. So if you look at this image, which I have on the screen, this is from the Kushan Empire area. This is from Gandhara, Gandharan art. And it is a warrior figure. It is a young man who is 
burly, if you will, has muscles, it is strong and upright. It is precisely what the text tells us in a way. It was a strong, upright, and handsome person. Now, we don't have any images that date back to the time of the Buddha. The physical imagery we have of, of a Buddha image comes hundreds of years after his lifetime. So even though the story says somebody who made an image should have seen him alive so they could make a portrait, the Indians didn't have portrait images. Portrait images of the body came from the Greeks. The Bactrian Greeks who were living in the Kushan era, era where the Gandharan art was made, the Greeks had introduced a real concept of portraiture. So they put the portrait of the king on their coins. And it's a portrait of the king. It isn't just a glorified image. And over time, the king ages. So the coins show us the king's getting older and older. It's one of the ways you date the coins. We see this with the British royalty, for example. Queen Elizabeth is slowly aging on the money. <laughs> it takes a while. They don't age her too fast, but she's aging. You don't see the 25-year-old who inherited the throne at a young age. You see now a mature woman on the, on the money. That's exactly what the Greeks had introduced the idea. So we, we're, these Gandhara the images of the Buddha and the, and the body is an indication of how people in Buddhism were trying to deal with Shakyamuni's body. And so they, they worked very hard at it. And once the image was introduced, the Buddha image of his body, then of course it became so dominant that you look almost in vain to ever find a Buddhist building that doesn't have an image of Shakyamuni's body. It's pretty rare. I have described to you though, and we'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow, <coughs> about uh, relics. We'll go into that. In the Kushan era, area, um, not only did they make these first, they probably made the first images of the Buddha. It was in that region that they made them put them. And the first one that probably ever occurred was on a coin. The first time anybody made an actual image of Shakyamuni's body was on the back of a Kushan coin because that's how they did it. The Greeks had introduced the idea, you put the king on the front of the coin, and you put a, a god or a divine person on the back of the coin. And so the Buddha shows up on the back of a coin. And those coins are very early, and they are the, we don't really have dated images in three dimension before those coins showed, him, showed his body. But in the Kushanas, we talked about the Jatakas. The body, ethically, was seen as something to give. If you really wanted to be ethical with your body, you gave it as a gift. And that's why all the Jataka tales where the Bodhisattva throws his body to the hungry tigers. The Bodhisattva cuts himself up. He throws himself in order to feed the, the hawk that has been denied their dinner of a dove by the King Shibi. You see, all these Jataka tales 
where the body of the Buddha or the Bodhisattva still is always seen by them as a gift. The important thing that you do with your body is to give it as a gift. And you give it as the ultimate gift. You kill it. These bodhisattvas who they killed themselves in many, in one sense. Now, all the stories say when the gods had really tested them, then they came down and put them back together. They resurrected the physical bodies. So it's like uh, in the Prajna Paramita with the, like, Sadaka Rudita goes out looking for the Buddha and he wants to uh, give him a gift, uh, give him a gift to the Bodhisattva who's going to teach him. He doesn't have any money. He, the gods come down and test him and say, we're looking for somebody who's willing to donate their body. And he says, here I am. If you'll pay me so I can buy a gift, you can have it. <laughs> and they say, well, we need you to cut into your bone and take out your marrow, and we need your blood for our sacrifice. That's what we want to buy from you. And he does it. And then the gods say, okay, okay, we see you're sincere. We were just kidding. <laughs> we're going to put you back together. There, your body is all back. It's the way it was before. So it's all right. So the stories of the body as it was used as a gift is it was, te it was a test. You test ethically. Do you really mean it when you say you would do anything for sentient beings? Okay, let's try you out. Here's a sentient being. Uh, it's, it's a hawk. It's a bird, but it's a sentient being. Uh, you want to save it, you want to keep it alive, you take this vow, you're going to have to give it your body. Did you really mean it, or were you just bragging? When the Bodhisattva does it, then they say, okay, now we'll put you back together. So, you see this time and time again in these stories, that the body is used as a gift, the gift is a test, then the body is put back into its proper form. So it's not as if the stories leave these bodies in bad shape. By the end of the story, they're still in good shape. We do this as well. A way in which we do it you may say this is very far from the Buddhist idea. But we do ask people to make their body a gift. And it's the military. We ask people to make the ultimate sacrifice. They must give their life if needed. There's no way to make them whole again in this story. And so when we see what happens in the military, when we have asked people to make the ultimate sacrifice, to put your life, your very life, out there, and to have to accept the fact that in fact you may be absolutely killed and finished on this earth, we do glorify it. We have all kinds of ritual to reward that gift. We have armed guards that protect the body. We have, we drape the coffin with the flag. We have very st stately serious rituals to deal with this because the person that you're dealing with has in fact given the gift. They have given the ultimate gift. 
They've given their bodies. Totally. And that's a big, that is really a big thing. One might say that in terms of the way we look at it, are they bodhisattvas? Um, we're, we're, we're conflicted about it. Let's put it that way. We are really conflicted about it because it is also <coughs> that it's associated with violence, it's associated with death of others. It's not a clear issue. But nevertheless, it is a part of our life and our culture. <coughs> and we are always struggling to understand it. I know Joseph is, is a chaplain in the military, and I'm sure that you run into this as a chaplain. I'm not yet a chaplain, Dr. But you're going in that direction, and you are working in, in and meet all of these military people, and this is what they're trained to accept, that you may have to go out there and fight in a battle, and you have cemeteries filled with white crosses to remind you thousands and thousands of young people are killed in wars all the time, everywhere. So it's not a secret. It's a reality. Are you willing to make the gift? Can you make that gift? <clears throat> um, so for some people, uh, you go to the DMV and you say, I'm willing to have my organs harvested. You can cut my body open and take out my liver and my heart and my kidneys and even my lungs. Whatever you want to do, you can have them. That's another form of giving the body. And that's the way in which the body gift is, is a kind of ethical issue. Are you willing to do that? Some people are not. They say, I can't stand the thought of it. I want my body left whole. I don't want it to be cut and, and I don't want this to happen. We, we live with these issues. But again, as I say, almost anything you do with the body turns out to be ethical. And you do it for whatever the ethical reasons are, even if you go into the military, even if you give parts of your body after you're dead, all of these are decisions which you're going to make. Not all bodily action is so very easy to deal with. Take speech. Speech is one of the body actions. So suppose I say to you something which really hurts your feelings. I say something to you that's really harsh. I try my best to hurt you as much as I can with my word. Speech is a body act can be enormously effective. With words, I can give people real discomfort or comfort. I can use this part of body action to do, and yet, when we think about it, when we really look at it, what in the world is speech? Speech physically is I move my mouth, my tongue, 
my voice box. I force air through there and I make a sound. So why is it that doing that thing and making a sound is going to cause somebody to be enormously upset? What, what is the reality of that speech? I utter a word, I say. I make a sound. And then I teach people what that sound means. And I communicate that that sound implies something about my body and the other person's body which is understood by both parties so that what I say either hurts or helps. So if I say to somebody, boy, are you ugly. You've got to be the ugliest person I have ever seen in my life. How can anybody be as ugly as you are? And you go on and on at somebody like that, and it's like, you're hurting me. This, is, this makes me feel terrible. My stress hormones in my body are just going crazy by every sound, every bit of that sound that hits my ears. And yet, from another perspective, speech is absolutely empty of any goodness or badness. What is it? It's just sound. It's just sound. It's just pressure. It's air pressure on my ear. And yet, ethically, that sound pressure coming out of somebody's mouth can do enormous harm or enormous good. So where in the world does the power come from, from speech? What makes speech so important? And it is. We really depend on speech as our communication. We say body language, how somebody holds their head, how they do their arms, whatever. But really, it's the sound. The sound which we interpret to say, I'm being hit at, I'm being criticized, I'm being put down, I'm being praised, I'm being lifted up. It's our interpretation and our, our <coughs> manipulation of those sounds to make it have its power. So from one perspective, bodily action is, and the Buddhists say this, one of the bodily actions is speech. They compare that as equal to the physical body's action. They knew that speech was somehow different. If I take my hand and hit you, okay, no doubt about it, that hurts. I can explain why when I punch somebody, they say, ouch, what did you do? You just hit me. Stop it. Don't hit me anymore. That we can understand. But the Buddhists were also saying, speech as an action is just as important. And the ethics of speech are as important as the body physical because it is part of the body physical. And yet, the speech is what probably hurts more. I think that you can insult and, and hurt somebody worse with what you say to them than if you hit them. I used to feel, I have to admit this, I used to feel, I, I never remember being struck as a child. I don't remember ever being spanked. I just
just don't remember that. However, I got talked to death. <laughs> there were times when I wanted to say, just stop talking, go ahead and hit me. <laughs> I'll take the hit any day. I don't want any more of these words. Please, please, give me a break here. Don't give me all these words. I think we've all gone through this kind of experience in our lives where we have these two kinds of bodily things that, that come at us and we're, we're struggling to figure out how in the world to deal with, with these. So, speech uh, can be really inspirational. It can motivate us. Um, it can just turn everything around. We can be changed in a moment sometimes by what we hear. We depend on it. Um, we have a whole profession called psychology, which is mainly based on speech. You go and sit and talk and talk with a therapist. Why is that? That speech does the opposite. It motivates, it calms, it, it gives support. So we, we use speech to do good. We can use speech to do evil. And yet when you look at it, the physical act of speaking is totally empty of any negative or positive feature. So I can say to somebody, you're really a wonderful person. What makes those sounds so meaningful to somebody? It has to do with the it's a behavioral thing where we're trained and those words touch into what we have been trained to think and do. If I spoke to somebody, of course, that's where we have troubles with language. If somebody speaks to me in another language, uh, there was an old cartoon in the New Yorker that I always have enjoyed. And it was a kind of um, racial cartoon in one sense, but it was intended to teach a message about racial issues. So it's a Japanese looking person sitting in a party with all Caucasians and saying, I'm going to tell you a joke in Japanese, but I warn you, it's a, it's a very dirty joke. And you know that nobody in the room is going to understand this joke. <laughs> I warn you, it's, it's, it's very... So we can use speech and nobody understands it. If you don't understand it, then what does it do to you? So therefore, we have another way to, to use the body. We yell. Or we use our body in such a way that we get across the idea that even if you can't understand what I say, you get it. <laughs> I'm really angry at you. I don't like what's going on. And we do this with children. Children don't understand language. And you hear people yelling at a little child to show them that they don't like what they're doing. So we use loudness and we use gesture and we use other things to communicate don't like. Um, my neighbor uh, helped teach her granddaughter when she was very young to sign for what she wanted 
and she taught her granddaughter, who couldn't yet say the words, that I'm hungry and I want something to drink and I'm sleepy I want to go to the bathroom and she had this whole and she used it. <laughs> she and her grandmother were communicating through signs. No words, but the body was being used to communicate the signs, the words. Not, maybe not words even, but needs, desires, <coughs> feelings.